وصلى الله تعالى وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد um, I was reminded by our constant forgetfulness when it comes to um, mentioning that there's a sujood um, in the salah, keep forgetting to announce it, uh, that I recently read an article that was counting um, bid'as that, has, that I've seeped in in, in taraweeh. I can't remember all of them, but one of the ones that was mentioned was that, was this, that announcing um, when the when there's a sajda tilawah uh, in a particular rak'ah, basically, is a bid'ah that has crept up in taraweeh. Um, I, I don't agree with that, so which is why I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning it now that um, I don't think it's a bid'ah. <clears throat> but I can see why somebody might think it is. Uh, a bit of because uh, there's no there's no uh, record of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba ever announcing that there's a sajda, even though in their time, you know, you'd assume that everybody didn't know when the when the sajda was. So I might as well say this. So the reason why it's not a bit of is because when something is done without the intention of Sunni. It's not done with the intention of it being a sunnah, but it is done out of some sort of need. Um, then it falls within what we might call the qawaid, qawaid al-sharia, the, the principles of sharia, and therefore cannot be regarded a bid'ah. And the biggest difference um, between the Prophet ﷺ's time and today is that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if there was no announcement, it didn't matter. Because from the back of the prayer, from the, from the back of the jama'ah to the front of the jama'ah, there was visibility. So at the time of, in Masjid Nawi, from right from the back row of the women, right, to the imam, it was visible. You could see. Does that make sense? So, you know, when you have multiple rooms, multiple floors, multiple halls, and so on, the announcements are kind of a necessity. Otherwise, it causes confusion. But in any case, the clue is the long Allah Akbar. And if, if for example, if, if some of the sisters ended up going into a instead of thinking that it was a rukur, and then when the imam stood up, you realized, oh, there was a sajda tilawa, then you can just go down, do the sajda, and come back up, and your salah's fine. Right? Or even if you didn't do that and just carried on after the rukur, your salah is still fine. All right, but we, you know, it's basically either way, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> the Imam Salah will rectify that error, inshallah. Ta'ala. Okay, so um, last time we left it at injustice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will that in the, in this, um, divine orchestra that is creation you know people are you know people are people are created stronger and weaker right um, and in that spectrum um, women carry a degree of vulnerability right um, and because of that vulnerability, and anybody who doesn't acknowledge that vulnerability uh, is, is, is either blind or arrogant, right? You know, it's there. Just because, just because um, uh, people in the modern era have, in, behind feminism have tried to deal with it, doesn't mean it's not there. The whole reason why feminism exists is because women are vulnerable, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... He, where this has happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He enjoins upon the stronger, He enjoins upon the strong to take care of the vulnerable. It's pretty much across the board, you'll see it, right? Um, and you can, if you take the gender issue out, you know, then for example, children are vulnerable. We know stories of what happens when children end up in the care of some twisted lunatic, right? You've all seen this. You've all seen the stories in the news, and these things are, of course, on the increase um, now with 
you know, people's minds getting more and more twisted by this never-ending pursuit of 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 desire, um, and people constantly testing the boundaries of what is morally acceptable and what is morally reprehensible. Um, so, you know, so the care of children is placed in the hands of parents. Right? and in the hands of society and elders and so on and so forth. We, it's our responsibility to protect them. And when we don't, when we don't, it is, it is oppression, it is dhulm. Right? Um, so for example, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I, should, I should do a separate talk on this, but I'll say this kind of as a by the by. For example, if you hit a child, your own child, okay, and be, make no mistakes about this, I, I'm telling you this, this is, there's no... There's no ifs or buts, right? If you hit your own child in a way that that, that is bruising, leaves a mark, is bruising, right? Then that is oppressive against your own child, right? And, you know, Allah protect us and Allah forgive us. Um, we could be accountable for that on the Day of Judgment. Does that make sense? Uh, but the, the, the fact remains that that is, that is an act of zulm and oppression against your own child. That's Sharia, brothers and sisters. That's Deen. Okay, the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam. Um, you know, he's he's. There's one authentic hadith in which the Prophet Salatu Wasalam indicates that uh, parents can smack their children, and that's in the hadith about Salah, when he said that. Um, uh, you know, if if they do not pray at ten, right, then hit them. Uh, he smacked them. Okay? But all interpretations of that are that it has to be darban ghayra mubarrihin. It has to be smacking in a non bruising, light, symbolic manner. Right? So the kind of. But the means and oh, tosh, tosh, you know, and like on the head and like leaving handprints and fingerprints and stick prints and all of that stuff. Um, I got hit by a teacher once, and I thought my hand was going to break. The guy hit me so hard. Right? This is there's no there's no there's no room for this in, in Islam in Sharia. Okay. So in the same way, um, whether uh, whether a woman or a female is a daughter, or whether a female is a sister, or whether a female is uh, a wife, um, whether she's an employee, whether she is, you know. In all walks of life, you know, she carries a certain vulnerability that a man doesn't have. Let's compare it in that way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives men, even they are the likely, the likely perpetrator of any oppression. Right? Because they are the stronger other half. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the responsibility of protecting them right, in the hands of, of, their, of their men. Right, so fathers protect their daughters, brothers protect their sisters, husbands protect their wives, and, so, and, and, and sons protect their mothers, and so on and so forth. Right, there is this protective relationship. Right, there is a certain universality, although it's usually understood that this verse about main, about men maintaining and protecting women is about husbands, but there is a certain universality to the verse as well, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says men are protectors and maintainers over women. Right, the broad, the context of the verse specifically is more directed towards the husband and wife relationship, but it's also true of father and daughter. It's also true of a sister if a father dies. When it comes to uncles, grandfathers protecting, and so on, etc. The protective responsibility goes that way. In those relationships, right, there are multiple levels of oppression in our society, which if we don't address, then essentially what happens is our daughters. Our wives, our sisters end up buying into the feminist kind of narrative. And essentially, it turns them away from Islam because usually the acts of oppression that are committed against our women in our communities and in our societies are often done with a twisted justification that brings Islam into the equation. Right? Whether that is this one's not gender specific, whether that is parents hitting and smacking their children and being particularly 
violent and stern or strict or harsh when it comes to matters of religion. Absolutely twisted logic, makes absolutely no sense, all right, because they're hardly going to love religion more, right? I mean, if, the, if your twisted logic is, if the twisted logic here is that they'll get the message that religion is more important, so I'm going to beat them for that and not beat them for other things, <coughs> it's not going to work. More likely, there's going to be trauma. Daughter gets married, but she doesn't get to stay with her family. Her husband, who she's just got married to, will stay with his family often. And she will end up staying with them, right? So she now loses her original sort of protective layer, moves into a house full of strangers, with one of whom she has some sort of a protective relationship with. And then comes this, these layers of cultural expectation, mostly not, not justified by Islam, sometimes tolerated Islamically. It's like, oh, well, you know, if it's there in the culture, then it's not necessarily haram as long as people treat one another rightly and so on and so forth. But then, you know, you guys have heard of structures of racism, right? So then you bring in structures of, of inequality and structures of abuse. And then you end up with problems where um, the son is in a difficult position, for example, if, if his parents don't treat his wife very well. He, his, his loyalties are now torn, right? So that brings conflict into his marriage. And parents are oblivious to this because they think, well, that's how it was for us. This is, this is the cultural norm, right? Um, so you end up with this massive issue of, you know, of in-law abuse, right? Daughter-in-laws suffering quite, I mean, I know, I know serious, serious horror stories, right, of daughter-in-law abuse, compounded by wider in-law in -law abuse, right? Where the sister-in-law comes, comes, comes to visit her parents and she thinks she's a guest now because she's got a sister-in-law, she's got a bhabi. Right? She's got a Bobby, so it's like, oh, Bobby's going to make the tea. Bobby's going to serve the food. Bobby's going to come down from her bedroom where she might have been cozying up to, your hus to her husband to make me tea. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm five years younger than her. Right? Or something. Or, or, or not. Or older. So what? But you've gone to your parents' house, for God's sake. Like, when did anybody have to wait on you when you went to your parents' house? But no. I've gone to my parents' house. Now, somebody, now there's a, a sister-in-law. She's going to wait on me. Right? And guess what the mother-in-law does? Daughter-in-law, come down. My daughters are here. All right? So now the daughter-in-law comes down to serve tea, right, to, the, to, to her daughter. Who can help herself? <laughs> does, does that make sense? But no, she's, she's now suddenly become Mehman. Suddenly she's a, she's a guest. These are, these are completely, it's, it's all done completely innocently because it's culturally expected. Because it's culturally expected, but people don't realize that these are layers and upon layers upon layers, right, of, of pressure, right, which then results in when that expectation isn't met, what happens? It's not like it's optional. When those expectations are not met, then the criticism comes, the, the, back, the backbiting comes, and all of that comes, right? So when you, if we, I was going to move on to talk, you know, we were, going to, we were talking about justice and things like that. And I was talking about the minimum of justice. Do you remember? Everybody remembers? The minimum is to do justice. But doing justice means avoiding all injustice. You cannot begin to do justice if you do not avoid all forms of injustice, brothers and sisters. What is the criteria? The criteria is... The hukuk based on the sharia, rights on the basis of the sharia. If somebody, if it is not somebody's shari'i obligation to do something, and you impose it upon them, and then those impositions are, are imposed through layers and layers and layers of cultural expectation, social and cultural expectation, then what happens is you then impose your own consequences. When the, when the expectation isn't met. So you've made something obligatory that is not obligatory. You've made something a right that is not a right. Does that make sense? 
So, so essentially, the balance of Sharia is lost because the what does what, what, what was that verse I told you? What's expected to happen is What's expected is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is mentioning this glorious rule that the way things should appear is that they deserve as many rights as there are against them. That the balance of right, the, the, that rights are balanced by duties. Duties are balanced by rights. If everything starts pushing, pushing one way, if everything starts pushing one way, then the balance is it's lost. Right? It's because why? Because what, is, what the Sharia doesn't impose is being imposed by us. It's being imposed by society. It's being imposed by, by culture. And so on. And sometimes this starts earlier. It starts with, um, you know, brothers were treated better than sisters at home, in the parental home. You understand? So she's culturally attuned to it because she's been serving her brothers at home all her life. And then she gets married, so she's okay. You know, she's comfortable with it. That doesn't make it right. So when these things are not balanced out, we end up with a society that has all these hidden Injustices, the beating of children, whether at home or whether it's in the mosque or the madrasa and so on. Do you understand? Women being abused through in-law abuse and so on and so forth. We end up with all of these injustices. And then what happens is our girls, our daughters, our wives end up vulnerable to the feminist narrative. And when they end up vulnerable to that, they become vulnerable to kufr and atheism. Does that make, does that make sense? Remember, I started by... Well, Earlier, one of the earlier talks was that the things that turn people away from Islam and into the hands of atheism, one of the things is the treatment of women. The treatment of women. And in that context, these are some of the things that we have to think about, that we have to consider. And the only criterion to think about them on the basis of is, is the Sharia of Islam. Right? That is justice. That is the fundamental criterion for justice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us and to our societies and to our homes, inshallah ta'ala.